Okay. Uh, yeah, I request you all to settle down. Okay, so let us get going. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great pleasure today to welcome all of you uh, on behalf of PIFR and in particular to Asset Colloquium uh, uh, to this very special colloquium as part of the DBS at 60. Uh, before I even proceed to say anything, I would like to really thank the organizers of DBS at 60, especially Maitre and Mahindra, uh, to making uh, this particular special colloquium possible. Uh, for some of you who probably uh, wondering what this asset is and why I talk of a DBS speaker into this, I want to take a minute to kind of say asset stands for advances in science, engineering and technology. Uh, this is a kind of a forum which organizes especially uh, talks mostly on uh, technical areas of what we do in the institute, namely sometimes detectors, sensors, electronics, data and systems, uh, you know, fields like that. But very specifically, it also handles a lot of topics which are typically not covered by the two other colloquia, which happens one on Wednesday, which is, of course, natural sciences faculty, which you had a colloquium a day before yesterday, and also the other colloquium, which is mathematics colloquium, which happens on Thursday. All of them happens at 4, 4 p.m. And ASIT also organizes quite a few topics which are very, you know, very closely linked to medical field. It straddles between, uh, you know, physiology and medical and biology and so on and so forth. So in a way, it is a forum which is slightly more diverse than the other two topics. And I also want to take another minute to kind of say uh, this particular year, uh, 19, I mean, 2023, uh, also happens to be 40 years of Asset Colloquium. So Asset Colloquium actually started way back in 1983, and it is celebrating 40 years. And some of these images that you see is something uh, announcing at that uh, you know, events, special events. So all the more important, all the more happy to have uh, uh, Professor Hassan here to talk and give this special asset colloquium today. And without taking more of uh, your time, I request Dr. Professor Sandhya to formally introduce today's speaker. It's a pleasure to introduce Geeti. You know what? I've known her for many decades and I don't know a single embarrassing story. So that tells you something about Geeti. I don't know what it tells about me, but I first met Geeti when I was a grad student. And I discovered one of her loves, drinking chai, which I finally figured out, happened at the same time as West Canteen Chai time. <laughs> So whenever she visited and she worked the floor below me, she would come up to have chai with her friend and it would always be the same time every single day. The other thing that I know she likes is good beer. <laughs> so those are my two embarrassing stories. Um, and when I came to interview in NCBS for a faculty position, this is again a very characteristic thing about Kethi. All my meetings had run over. So I reached her when, after the end of my slot and she says, Sandhya, I know you. I have to do an experiment. You go meet the next person. <laughs> so there you are. So Geeti has always been very focused on the many interesting questions that she studied and has always been sort of an inspiration for people like me who are cell biologists who want to be in vivo cell biologists. She picked a very complex problem to look at intracellular calcium and to look at the IP3 receptor and intracellular calcium signaling and how it connects with the environment, you will see today in her talk 
that she started from IP3 receptor mutants has come a long way in elucidating in vivo functioning of different kinds of stores of calcium and what they do in animal flight, animal nutrition. And now more recently, she has gone into mammalian systems to try to understand it in the context of neurodegeneration and other things. So brave, fearless, and absolutely focused on getting things done. I've also had the opportunity to be on the thesis committee of some of her students. And I know for her to be a very on-point mentor, it's very clear about what needs to be done and very quietly supportive not someone who's necessarily going to shout it from rooftops and has always been very supportive of minorities and women in science. And she herself is a minority and an intersectional minority. So it's a very, very great pleasure to have Gaiti here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya, for that very, very kind introduction. I've turned it on. Yeah, I've turned it on. I think my voice is clear, right? Okay, that very kind introduction. And uh, I wish some of my students were here to agree or disagree at this point. Actually, actually, one student is online. So I'm very happy to hear that. She's now in Canada. She's doing her postdoc there, but she's joined. So hopefully she'll listening. Anyway, so, uh, and before I carry on, I also want to thank Maitri and Satya for giving me this opportunity. So I just wanted to tell you, Satya, that in fact, yes, that day when I was speaking, I mentioned that it's 40 years since my association with TIFR. So I actually joined TIFR as a visiting fellow in 1983. So in, <laughs> like you, yes. So in a sense, you know, it's 40 years and I'm here giving this colloquium. It's very nice to be able to do it, yeah. And thank you, Maitri, and uh, all the other organizers for having me here. It's been a long, long time since I've come to TIFR, so it's it's interesting to be here. Okay, so let me try and talk a little bit about what we do. And uh, it's I sort of tried to put together an overview of what we've done over the years without getting into too much detail. So, you know, just uh, bear with some of the information because I may not provide you the data for it. But if you're interested, please, you know, do go ahead and ask me. I'm here till tomorrow afternoon. So I'm just going to sort of gloss over some of those things. Okay, so what's the question that uh, I'm asking? One second. Okay, now we have a. Hmm? Click on the screen. Okay, yeah, that, that does happen sometimes. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, yeah, that also works. Second, let me see. It was working actually. Yeah. The message comes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Here, here, this one. Yeah, this one. Sure. Okay. But, uh, okay, back I can. Okay. Now it should be okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So the question, let me try and sort of pose the question. So I think uh, most of you were here for the last uh, session and you have a very good idea of what happens in neurons and how uh, information is transmitted in neurons. And uh, there's a presynapse and there's a postsynaptic neuron. And, you know, we know that there's an action potential that comes along, reaches the synapse. There are these voltage-gated channels that sit at the presynaptic end, which open as a result of this change in voltage. And you get entry of calcium. And then you get release of neurotransmitters, which is then, you know, reaches the presynapse, goes across the postsynapse, the, the cleft, the synaptic cleft reaches the postsynaptic membrane, which is then has a number of uh, ligand-gated calcium channels that are present or other kinds of channels as well. And then those in turn, you know, make changes in the postsynaptic membrane and the, you know, information is transmitted along. And this is generally thought to be, I mean, this is the way it's presented to us, at least when we are studying it originally, it's sort of presented as an all or none thing that you get, you get a, you know, huge uh, uh, change in, uh, the, the voltage here and then as a result of that you get the propagation of the action potential and then you get similarly a change here and you get you know further propagation to the next level wherever it is uh, it's now becoming clear over time very much that this is not how all uh, you know information is transmitted it's not possible for uh, our brains to function if everything is all or none because a lot of our actions 
and a lot of the animal reactions are graded and you cannot have all or none kind of answers everywhere you know you need gradation and a lot of gradation comes into this kind of signaling as well it comes in by the kinds of uh, channels that are present how they respond uh, it comes in by you know various kinds of proteins that you know change the way what is present on synaptic vesicles so many of these things were discussed today and i think you know there is a way of grading uh, and that's what we call plasticity at some level right there is a way of grading signals in this mechanism uh, what i'm going to talk to you today about and that is i'm not i'm not going to be touching upon that very much okay i just wanted to bring that up to sort of say that where the difference lies from what we've been studying so there is another mode of signaling which is uh, somewhat different from this kind of calcium signaling where calcium enters through these channels which is uh, happens when you have uh, neuromodulators that link primarily to g protein coupled receptors and actually those are present here as well so there's something present here which looks like that and these neuromodulators uh, will activate these g protein coupled receptors and what we are interested in understanding is when these G protein coupled receptors leads to the formation of IP3 and DAG. So this IP3 then binds to the IP3 receptor, which is present on intracellular calcium stores. And here I've shown you primarily the ER, the ER calcium store, and allows for calcium release from the ER store. Okay. So this calcium now is an intracellular calcium release. It's very different from what you've seen here because this is all coming from outside. And as this happens, what you get is a depletion of the ER store. So when the ER store depletes, there has to be a way by which so, the, so your whole calcium homeostasis of the cell will change because this ER will uh, the calcium will come out, and then because a cell cannot, I mean, in neither neurons nor any other cell cannot have too high a calcium level in the cell. So much of this calcium then, whatever it does in the cell, signaling properties, much of it is actually pumped out. So it goes right out of the cell. And so what you end up with is a situation where this store will get depleted. And now this store has to be refilled. And so this process, which is called store operated calcium entry, because you've released this calcium, is first uh, sort of uh, the signaling for that begins by this protein called stim which when you don't have calcium it forms multimers and then talks to this protein which is present on the plasma membrane called ori which is a channel and then essentially gates this channel to bring in calcium okay so what you have first is a release of calcium from here and depending on how much calcium is released at this point you will get a level of depletion. If the depletion is huge or if it's reasonable and if there's enough stim around, you will get store operated calcium entry. So essentially, you have two mechanisms here that are operating. In many cases, you will get the formation of IP3 and IP3 mediated calcium release. And this happens in depending on how much neuromodulator came in, there'll be small amounts of calcium released, larger amounts of calcium released. And then depending on how much the store is depleted, there'll be store operated calcium entry. And that again will depend on how much of these stimuli molecules come together to bring in store operated calcium into the cell. So my interest actually uh, began with the IP3 receptor to try and understand, given all these mechanisms, what does the IP3 receptor mediated calcium release actually do in neurons? We know that there is plasticity that comes in through so many other mechanisms. Does this play a role at all in, in uh, neuronal function? And what kind of function does it do? You know, what does it actually bring about? And that's the question that we asked many, many years ago and have now gone on to try and understand in the context of uh, store operated calcium entry as well. So, I'll do it from here. Uh, so, okay, so now I, I just wanted to mention that this happens. I, I do this work in the context of Drosophila. And uh, what I'm showing you here now is actually this whole procedure that I talked to you about. Okay, so the first blip is release of calcium from the IP3 receptor. And this is actually a Drosophila neuron that I'm showing it to you in. And then the second uh, surge that you see is store-operated calcium entry. 
And the way we do this experiment is that we start by keeping the cells in absolutely, there's no calcium at all in the, in the medium. And you deplete the uh, calcium using, you can either use an agonist for a G protein coupled receptor. But in this case, what we've used is a pharmacological agent that essentially allows for all stored calcium to come out. And then once you've done that, you've depleted the first uh, round of uh, the ER store completely, then you add back calcium. So this is called the calcium add back experiment. You add it back into the media. And as you can see, there's this huge surge that happens after the first release. And uh, you'll see the time. Yeah, and this, this huge big surge, and that is the store operated calcium entry. So then essentially there are two peaks that are happening, okay? And uh, this is how we actually study it. And this is a mechanism that we use uh, frequently to try and uh, um, understand what exactly the cellular processes are that are happening in the cell. Okay. This one is working. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with some genetics. Okay. This is how we got into it. Okay. The way we decided to try and understand how IP3 receptor causes, what kind of functions it has in neurons, uh, we started by making IP3 receptor mutants. And we made a whole series of mutants. Okay. So some of them were uh, dead as larvae, some of them survived up to adulthood. And I'll talk to you first about the larval ones. So these are, this is a very strong combination, okay? This is a combination, this is a heterolytic combination of two IP3 receptor mutants that we generated in the 90s, 1990s. And this uh, is, uh, this is a null allele and this is another allele. And if you put them together and then you try and look at the larvae, what you find is that you get slightly smaller larvae that don't grow very well and actually don't pupate and do not become adults. So this is how the wild type looks. Uh, Many years later, when we made mutants in the STEM gene, okay, the STEM, this is a knockout, this is a CRISPR knockout that we made for STEM, uh, um, we found exactly the same phenotype coming up, okay. So this was something that actually puzzled us a little bit because as I mentioned to you, I mean, IPC mediated calcium release is something that comes, you know, is, is related to stored release and the uh, stored operated calcium entry seems to be a huge surge that happens as a result of stored operated calcium entry. And yet when you look at the phenotypes, they looked remarkably similar and, you know, I mean, it was not very clear why, you know, everything is happening. I mean, we can see, think that some of the phenotypes would be related, but that the most, you know, sort of gross phenotypes that you see are also very similar was a bit of a surprise. So anyway, we, we had this phenotype and we decided to look at it and I'll talk to you now about, because we've understood it better in this thing. So I'll try and understand, explain to you what happens here. Okay. Then when we looked at the older uh, fly, so this is now uh, mutants, which are, uh, this one is a mutant here, is an IP3 receptor mutant. And these are ones that are now adult viable. Okay. So they are not terribly healthy, but you know, they look pretty okay. And you can see that again, you see a phenotype. This is the flight phenotype that we see in IP3 receptor mutants, which we saw in 2004. And now many years later, when we did a similar kind of experiment with the Ori mutant, okay, so this is actually an Ori dominant negative version that we made and expressed. You can see that the phenotype is exactly the same. They don't fly. So here's the IP3 receptor mutant, which doesn't fly. And here's the Ori dominant negative, which also doesn't fly. So essentially sort of telling us that these mutants are doing, I mean, that IP3 receptor and store operated calcium entry seem to be working more in sync than was expected. I mean, it seemed to be a little surprising. And so the cellular basis of this is something that we've only begun to understand actually only in the last very few years. So here is what I was talking to you about. Okay, here is the IP3 mediated calcium release. And here is the store operated calcium entry. Okay. And what I'm showing you here is the wild type form. Yeah, the green one is the wild type. Oh, sorry, the, the black one is the wild type, this one here, okay? And what we found was that in Drosophila neurons, which I, and I showed you those cultures, right? In Drosophila neurons, even if you depleted the store, and uh, this is now a store that's been depleted using the pharmacological agent. So you fully depleted the store. In the IP3 receptor mutants, you still didn't get store operated calcium entry. Now, this doesn't make sense if you think about it, because the store depletion has happened, even it's not happened through the IP3 receptor, I agree, 
but it has been depleted. And now when you do the calcium add back experiment, you're still not seeing store operated calcium entry. So uh, this was puzzling to put it mildly. And this is in fly neurons. And again, this is an old observation that we saw. And this could all be rescued back. So if you put back stimuli, you could see that you could rescue these things back. So clearly, this whole thing was something to do with the fact that, you know, the, the stimuli were not functioning properly in the IP3 receptor mutants. And the connection was something that we got interested in trying to figure it out. And this is what Pragya did actually as a student. She then went with another student, Bipon. The two of them uh, looked, decided to look at this in human neurons. So here is a human uh, differentiated neuron. Okay, this is using a human stem cell line. We made human differentiated neurons and we look to see whether the same thing happens in human neurons. And sure enough, we get exactly the same phenotype. So here you are, you can see the IP3 mediated calcium release here and then uh, or the stored depletion. And you can see in the wild type, it's here, well as in the mutants. And this is not a mutant now, this is a knockdown with an shRNA. And you can see that it's much less. And then to try and you know, do sort of more work to get to the mechanism of this, what uh, Pragya did was to do the same experiments in a human neuronal cell line, SHSY5Y, and found exactly the same phenotype. So this is just a picture to show you human neurons, and this is the experiments that were done in that. So essentially what I'm showing you here then is that what we found in fly neurons, exactly the same thing we are seeing, the same phenotype we are seeing now in human neurons. So <clears throat> what is happening? So the first thing that uh, uh, Pragya tried to do was to actually put back in these cells, these human neuronal cells, an IP3 receptor transgene in which the pore was dead, essentially, which cannot release calcium. Okay? So the, the, the canonical idea of an IP3 receptor is that it binds IP3 and it releases calcium, right? Here you've taken a version which has been tested by many other people, so I'm not going to go into that, in which there's a mutation in the pore, in the calcium channel, which completely blocks calcium release, okay? You take that and you put it back into the cells which are knocked down with IP3 receptor. You put it back and you find that you actually rescue back the calcium, uh, the store-operated calcium entry. So then telling us very clearly that there was, uh, you know, that it's not the calcium release which is important. It's not this calcium release which is important in this process. There is something else that is happening. And what is this something else? That was the big question. And uh, just to be certain, we, uh, but Pragya checked that this, this rescue was based on stim and Orion, So she knocked down Orion and showed that it was actually, uh, <clears throat> it was through, uh, this entry was through uh, the store operated mechanism. So then what we did was to take uh, other mutants, and this was work that we did in collaboration with uh, Colin Taylor in Cambridge, who had made many of these mutants. So what he suggested was that we should use these ligand binding domain mutants, okay? So this is the, the IP3 receptor, and uh, it has this ligand binding domain, and these residues are absolutely essential for ligand binding, okay? So, and what you can do is you can mutate these residues to glutamine. And if this is done, then the ligand binding is abrogated completely. Again, this is work that was there in literature and we just sort of. And uh, when we took this kind of a mutant back into the, into the uh, cells in which we had done the knockdown, what you can see is that the one mutant, which is, you know, more deficient in ligand binding, you don't get back rescue. This is this green one here, the dark green one. And then the one other mutant in which you have a bit of ligand binding, you get back some partial rescue. And this is the actual knockdown condition. Okay. So then what this essentially told us was that there are two steps here. One is the calcium release. But maybe even before calcium release, there is binding of IP3 to the IP3 receptor, because that's what this is doing. And that somehow that binding of IP3 to the IP3 receptor is what allows for stimuli coupling to happen. You know, it makes it better for some reason. And uh, so, th so that suggests then that the levels of IP3 within the cell have to be, you know, correct. Because if there's less IP3, you will have less IP3 binding. So through using a pharmacological agent, which prevents uh, IP3 formation, it essentially inhibits the G protein. Pragya showed that, in fact, 
in just a wild type cell, if you knock down the levels of, uh, if you if you add this pharmacological agent, you will find that you will get less store operated calcium entry. So sort of agreeing with our idea that ligand binding is very, very crucial to this whole phenomenon. Okay, so then she looked to see whether, you know, this stimuli coupling is actually happening. And this is using this method, which is called proximity ligation assay. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. The details don't matter. Essentially, what it does is it looks at these the, the proximity of these two proteins. So it looks at stem and ori, how close they are together. And depending on if they really do come close together, then you get these red clusters that form through an enzymatic assay. And uh, you can see here that after uh, store depletion in the control cells, you get many of these things forming. In the knockdown cells, the IP3 receptor one knockdown cells, these are much fewer. In the in the poor dead mutant that I showed you, the one without the calcium channel, you can see these come back. And in this case here, they don't come back. So essentially telling us that it's the stimuli coupling which is affected. And uh, this actually has interesting uh, meanings because what it suggests then is that when you have depletion of the store, there are two ways by which you get this coupling. One is when the neuromodulator binds and you know triggers the G protein coupled receptor and you get formation of IP3, that IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor and sort of starts bringing these two things together. You know? And so essentially you have convergent regulation by the IP3 receptor. And then of course, when the store depletes, there is release of calcium. So there are two ways by which this neuromodulators will drive the, the release of this calcium. Uh, this is as opposed to something like the ryanodine receptor, which is also an ER calcium release channel, which is actually triggered by calcium-induced calcium release. And that is something that actually is triggered when you have, you know, your voltage-gated calcium channels. When they bring in calcium, they can trigger calcium-induced calcium release. But then this one is not going to be coupled in the same way, in the convergent way that I talked about. Okay, So it will only happen when there is sufficient depletion of uh, calcium here. So essentially suggesting that there is, you know, the store operated calcium entry and IP3 mediated calcium release is very, very sort of closely linked in neurons. I, uh, the reason I'm saying neurons is because this whole mechanism had in different ways been tested in T cells. Okay, so, so store operated calcium entry was actually discovered in T cells. It was discovered in uh, T lymphocytes. And much of this work had been attempted, not in the way that we have done it, but you know the idea that whether the IP3 receptor would link to store operated calcium entry had been tested, and they hadn't seen it there. And then, so, in fact, we had a very hard time getting this published because it was being reviewed by people in the T cell field, and they were like, you know, this can't be true because we've tested it. And then, you know, it took some sort of uh, various experimental. Uh, efforts to try and you know tell them that no this is not the case so in fact it turns out that even in non excitable cells there is this kind of regulation to some extent but it requires that both the ip3 receptor ip3 levels drop and the ip3 receptor levels drop and only then you end up seeing some of this regulation so it's a sort of cell type specific thing and neurons it clearly seems to be very important because we see it all the way from drosophila up to human neurons so why is this even important, What I've told, this whole story that I've told you? One of the reasons we think it might be interesting is that there is, uh, there is, there is a disease called the, the spinal cerebellar ataxias, okay? And there's a whole range of them. And essentially what they end up doing is they end up causing degeneration of uh, the um, cerebellum, the cerebellar cells, Purkinje neurons in the cerebellum. And one of the reasons that this happens is that the cerebellum and the Purkinje neurons are particularly enriched in the IP3 receptor. In fact, it is from the, uh, the cerebellum of the, the bovine cerebellum that the IP3 receptor was first isolated as a protein. And uh, it's been known for a while that mutations in, in the IP3 receptor 1 cause spinal cerebellar ataxia. But most of these were pretty mild ataxias, and they were usually caused by heterozygosity. So one copy is missing and you get a sort of, you know, phenotype pretty late in life, you know, 40s or 50s or so. Uh, more recently, what people found was that there's an SCA29. And this is something that happens in children. So it's now a young onset one. And if you look at SCA29, what you find is there's a huge propensity of mutations that happen in the ligand binding domain. 
So one of the ideas that we have is that perhaps this, this reason that, you know, because they are uh, so many of them are in the ligand binding domain, that uh, they essentially not only do they affect IP3 mediated calcium release, but they're also affecting store operated calcium entry. And that is the reason why this particular version of SCA is a young onset, because if you have so much of, you know, dysregulation of intracellular calcium signaling, then you get a much earlier phenotype and perhaps leading to cell death. So this is something that one would like to be able to study. And one of the ways we are trying to do it now is to build this SCA29 model in the SHSY5 by cells that I talked to you about using CRISPR editing, and then try and see whether we can, you know, actually see whether any of these things are actually happening the way I'm suggesting. It's just a hypothesis. Okay, so having talked to you about uh, sort of the cellular part of it, what I'll try and do for the rest of the talk is to discuss with you how, uh, what we think at the organismal, I mean, what is happening at the organismal level. So this is happening at what I've talked to you about is actually in the cell and in, in neurons, but then how does this affect, you know, organismal function and uh, essentially neuronal cell function and then neural circuits and behavior. Okay, so here's a, uh, I hope I can get this to work. Yeah, okay. So stim knockout larvae, as I showed you earlier, are not very uh, sort of, uh, they don't grow very well. And uh, one of the things that Nandushri in the lab found was that stim knockout larvae, which are shown on the right, they don't feed very well. So they stop growing at a certain time, but even before they stop growing, if you put them into a food, uh, this thing, they don't eat very well. And uh, if you look at this, uh, the count the mouth hook movements, you can see that it's much less than the wild type. And this is ages in uh, sort of the larval development. And here you can see, if you look at the amount of food that they've eaten, if you cover, you know, fill up the food with uh, blue dye and then look at it, you can see that they are, uh, you know, different, uh, eating much less. So here they are, you can see that they're much less than uh, the wild type form. This is actually two kinds as seen at a later developmental time point compared to this. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, the way that we thought of, you know, addressing this question is to try and see which neurons are involved in this and then go and study them more. And what Nandashri found was that if you put back stim, and this is a full complete stim knockout larva, so it has no protein at all, if you put back stim in just these few cells that are present here in the brain, you actually get back a pretty recent rescue. And you can see that they look, you know, they can eat and they've grown much more. So what's going on? What is stim doing in these neurons? And this is this uh, a high mag of these neurons shown here in the brain. And these are dopaminergic neurons. So what she found was that one of the things that, that happens is if you uh, depolarize neurons by putting potassium chloride on them, they show a huge calcium surge. And that's shown here for the control neurons. When she looked in the mutant condition, which is uh, shown here, you can see that the surge is much less at this age. And then if you go a little further on in age, then it's almost completely gone. And again, if you put back the stem transgene, you can see a rescue for it, right? So essentially telling us that the loss of stim from these neurons has changed their ability to respond to, you know, to properly to depolarization. And we don't actually know why it's doing that, but that's what it's, uh, you know, that's what the data showed. As a result of that, if you don't, if neurons don't depolarize, the expectation is that they will not be able to release neurotransmitter. And uh, that's what Nandishri showed here, that she, she then looked at uh, the levels of uh, dopamine release at the terminals of those neurons using a fluorescent sensor for dopamine called GRAB-DA. And sure enough, if you put this, uh, so what she did was she added the neurotransmitter, the neuromodulator that would that makes these cells respond, and that is acetylcholine. And when you add acetylcholine, you get release of uh, dopamine, which is shown here, this one in the wild type. And then when you do it in the stim knockout neurons, you see very little you see almost no response at all. And if you do it in the rescue neurons, you do see a response. It doesn't come back to the wild type levels, but it comes back to a reasonable extent. So essentially what we've ended up doing is you've lost intracellular calcium, you've lost store operated calcium entry. And as a result of that, you've created neurons which are no longer able to respond 
to a neuromodulatory input and are also no longer able to release a neural modulator because we know that in this case, dopamine is itself functioning as a neuromodulator because it doesn't actually, these neurons don't actually uh, uh, synapse onto the neuropeptidergic cells, but they actually cause excitability of the neuropeptidergic cells, which is data I'm not showing you. So the model we have here is that these dopaminergic cells are releasing dopamine and as a result of that, creating, you know, uh, aligned for release of neuropeptides, and that leads for persistent feeding of these larvae. So that as a result of which they keep eating. And if you stop that, then they, you know, this is affected. We also found one of the things that happens is that we get changes in the levels of certain neuropeptides. So we found some level of transcription regulation, and this was an RNA-seq experiment that was done and found that certain insulin-like peptides change. And as a result of this, what you find is that growth is actually affected. So essentially, these neurons drive both feeding and growth indirectly, one by affecting release of neuropeptides, the other by synthesis of neuropeptides. And that is what seems to affect the stim knockout phenotype. So this is one of the phenotypes that, you know, sort of told us what was uh, that, you know, there were very sort of important systemic effects that happen as a result of uh, uh, the changes in store operated calcium entry. But that still didn't tell us, you know, why is it that cellular function is affected? As I said to you, you know, that we, we knew that there was loss of uh, excitability, but why? So is there changes in ion channels? Is it that the calcium that is, you know, being uh, coming in through store operated calcium entry is directly acting on ion channels and preventing them? I mean, uh, not allowing them to be functional if it doesn't come in. Is it excretion? Is it regulation? We had no idea. And then similarly, is the neurotransmitter release that is happening, is it direct or is it through activity changes that have happened? Is, or, so all these questions came up and we needed to sort of look at this a little more carefully. So this uh, we did uh, in using the uh, ORI um, model that I showed you earlier, which is using this ORI dominant negative transgene. So this is a transgene that uh, Trayambak developed in the lab which is essentially very similar to what I showed you earlier, the poor dead mutant for the IP3 receptor, except that the URI is a much smaller channel, it's much easier to do this. And this was blocked in uh, its, uh, uh, this mutation, this E1ATA essentially creates a block and so the calcium is unable to enter. So it just completely stop, you know, doesn't allow any store operated calcium entry at all when it's present there. Uh, I should mention that these channels, this URI is a, is a tetrameric channel, uh, there are tetramers, and even if one of them is mutated, it sort of prevents entry. So essentially, if you overexpress this, you you know block store operated calcium entry. And uh, so to try and get the cellular part of this, you know, of how, what exactly does uh, you know store operated calcium entry do within neurons? Uh, what uh, we looked, for, we needed to know what is the developmental stage and which cell type is involved. So it could have been, you know, that flight phenotype could come from anywhere, you know, from these st different stages that I talked about. In fact, what uh, Trembuck found in 2015, and this was an old paper, was that the flight phenotype essentially derived from a set of neurons which are present in the adult brain, which again are dopaminergic neurons, and which are present here and here. And I'll just show you the data for that. So this is what I'd shown you the earlier image, this thing. Essentially, if you drive dominant negative in those dopaminergic neuron subset, you get flies which are not able to fly at all. And that's the control. <clears throat> so what to understand at the cellular level what's going on here, what uh, Rishabh then did was to try and figure out at which stage is ORI dominant negative required uh, or does it cause this phenotype? Essentially, at which stage do you express it? So he very carefully expressed it throughout development and found that this is the stage when it's uh, most active. So if you express ORI dominant negative at this stage of development, then you get absolutely no flight at all. And you can see that here. So this stage of development and then the two hours here, actually two days here, you see absolutely zero, zero flight. Well, as before that and after that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to make a difference at all. So what's going on at this stage? One of the things we looked at was to see whether these neurons are you know, normal. And uh, at least with the, you know, the first approximation, you could see the cell bodies were fine and they sent projections. So this is looking in the adult now. And you can see that they've sent projections to the right part of the brain. So there was no obvious defect in that sense. 
So the other thing that we thought was that perhaps it's changing gene expression. And the reason we thought of that was in part because in, in, it is known in T cells that store operated calcium entry has huge effects on gene expression. So what then Rishav did was to actually sort these neurons out using Rishav and Stisha this is together. They sorted out these neurons from about a, you know, 300 to 400 dissected brains and then did an RNA-seq with them. And this RNA-seq re revealed a number of genes which were down-regulated and a few that were up-regulated. So <clears throat> clearly, and what I'm saying here, what I'm calling FP DANs are essentially this, and the reason we call them FP DANs is to say that they are flight-promoting DANs, okay? DANs being dopaminergic neurons. Uh, so now, to try and understand what's going on here, what is exactly store-operated calcium entry doing here, what Richard did was to take all the genes that were expressed in these neurons and try and figure out what their normal expression is like. Okay, So you just take all the genes and you look to see where they are normally expressed. What he found was that one cluster of the genes that are normally expressed in these DANs, in these dopaminergic neurons, one cluster is, seems to have higher expression in larvae. And then there's one cluster which is expressed exactly at the pupil time that we saw where store-operated calcium entry was required. So this set of genes... Then when he looked at to see what, what were the genes that were down-regulated, he found that many of the down-regulated genes fell into this cluster here. Only very few of them fell into this one. So this set of genes then, to us, seemed like a good candidate to call them as store-operated calcium entry-regulated genes. That these ones were probably that, you know, were up-regulated here and were down-regulated in the loss of store-operated calcium entry, uh, probably store-operated calcium entry-regulated or directly regulated by it. And the question then was that what are these genes and what do they do? So one of the genes, one set of one class of genes that these that fell out of this set of genes were genes that are involved in iron transport. And that I think now goes back to the original point that I had made that when I said that stim knockout larvae showed loss of excitability. So this sort of begins to explain why that is happening. And so here you are, you can see that many of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, channel genes, sodium channel, potassium channel, chloride, voltage-gated ligand, many, many of them were in this iron transport category, and many of them were down-regulated in this case. And in fact, uh, Rishav looked to see whether, uh, uh, you know, you get the same kind of effect that we got with stim knockout, whether we see the same thing here. And if this movie runs, no, I don't think it will. Okay, so it doesn't matter. What, the, what happens is that, he did the same potassium chloride experiment, you know, and found that in wild type, you get a nice, uh, you know, in, increase in uh, uh, change in calcium, well as in the E1ATA condition, that was lost. So essentially telling us that excitability was lost in, or at least considerably decreased in this case. And actually, you can see that here, okay? So this is the graphs. So when you add potassium chloride, you see this huge peak of calcium here. And in the E1ATA condition, you can see that it's considerably reduced. Is this the loss of excitability actually have anything to do with the flight phenotype? So what we did then was to bring back excitability into these channels, into these cells by putting back a bacterial channel, a bacterial channel that changes the, the level of, uh, you know, the membrane voltage. And, and so it allows them to be excitable more easily. And if you put this channel back there, you can see that you've got a, a response as well as you see back flight okay so that actually is the bigger uh, you know the thing so essentially telling us that you're getting back cellular function but not only are you getting back cellular function you're getting back systemic function and you can actually see more flight in this case so excitability is clearly very important uh, does this excitability affect the functioning of these dopaminergic neurons was the next question and to do that what uh, rishab then did was to look at this is where these, so these are the neurons, and actually this is a further subset of those neurons, and this sort of helped us to be able to image better. And so these neurons actually uh, send their projections, their axonal uh, projections to a region in the uh, brain, which is called the mushroom body, and this is that region where they project to, and this is, this is shown here in a cartoon style. So what Rishav then did was to look at these using a high-resolution microscope. And uh, this is something called the Airy scan that we've just got in the last two years. And when you looked with that, so as I had shown you earlier, if you remember, that the projections were normal. But now what we're looking at is the complexity of the projections 
in that region of the brain. And when you look at that, here's what the wild type looks like, and here's what the E1 ATA looks like. So you can see that they're considerably diminished. And much of this has actually got a lot of synapses in it. So this is the same protein that I think Vimlesh was talking about, which marks the presynaptic regions. And what you can see is that these, well, we haven't done the NC82 here, but what you can see is that these, these, these complexity is much reduced in E1 ATA, and it comes back if you put back the sodium channel. So, so, so the, the bacterial sodium channel, which restored excitability, which restored flight, also brings back a reasonable amount of complexity here. So essentially telling us then that activity that is gone as a result of loss of store operated calcium entry is crucial for the final sort of axonal patterning and uh, you know fine patterning of the uh, brain. And not surprisingly, we also found release uh, less of dopamine release here. So you can see that the dopamine release is considerably reduced. Uh, that's what's shown here, much similar to what uh, this um, uh, Nandishri had done earlier. And in fact, uh, okay, so now I'm going to jump a little. How much time do I have? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll be able to do it. Okay, so I'm going to move to something else now, which is actually, I mean, it's, it's related, but it's a little bit more uh, sort of getting delving deeper into what the gene expression changes are all about. So you can see here that this, this is the, uh, uh, you know, the dopamine release has come back here, you know, and this is a gene that I'm going to introduce you now to, which is called set two. So uh, basically to, to try and understand what is it that happens? How does store operated calcium entry actually affect the ion channel genes? What is the mechanism there? What is the gene expression mechanism that happens there? Because this is something that was not at all clear from uh, any literature at all. We had no idea how this was happening. The, the mechanism that operates in T cells in the mammalian system cannot operate in Drosophila because that particular transcription factor is just not present in flies at all. So it had to be something else and we had no idea how this was happening. So we identified a new transcription. I mean, actually, the transcription factor was already known, trithorax-like, but we identified it in the context of SOCE. And the way that Rishabh did this was to essentially take those SOCE uh, responsive genes and do a computational assay uh, and just look to see what is the you know transcription factors that bind. He found this mutant, uh, this uh, uh, transcription factor called trithorax-like which also expressed very strongly in the right stages. So, so he found a number of different ones, but this one seemed to express the best. So it seemed like a good one to go with. And so obviously we wanted to see whether TRL is involved in THD prime uh, in these, uh, you know, the same flight promoting uh, neurons. And so he knocked down this thing and sure enough, you see flight deficit. So at least that tells us that the same transcription factor is involved. And then, went on to see what are the genes that it affects, at least some of the genes that we thought, and this was again based on some previous work that we had done. We looked to see whether, and one of the genes we found that was downregulated was this gene called SET2. And I'll again tell you why I think that's important. In addition, it seems to also regulate actually the IP3 receptor and the G protein coupled receptor that is present on these cells. So essentially it seems to be some kind of a, you know, a, a, a transcription factor that drives the calcium signaling within these cells. So what is set two? Set two is a histone uh, um, methylation factor, and it does this trimethylation on K36, the lysine K36. And what is known about this is, and this is again, I'm really going into uh, you know zones which are very very new to me. And essentially, we've been doing this mostly in in uh, sort of uh, collaboration with Dimple. So what this uh, uh, trimethylation does is it happens on the, you know, on the gene body and it essentially allows for transcription activation and elongation. So genes which have this trimethyl mark are amplified in expression. And from what it looked like from our work, what it suggested was the store-operated calcium entry is somehow leading to, through TRL, is leading to the expression of SET2, greater expression of SET2. And, uh, this is what we think. This is this this region here, and essentially, when you look at it, you can see that set two is down. Is among these transcription facts, one of the genes that is down maximally is set two, and uh, indeed, there are a large number of uh, 
trithorax like uh, upstream binding sequences on the set two gene. So essentially suggesting to us that trithorax like binds to set two and sets it up. And why am I talking so much about set two? Because it turned out that if you take set two, and as I showed you earlier, that it rescued back the phenotype of the cellular phenotype. But in fact, if you take set two and you put it into the same neurons where we've lost flight, you can actually get back flight. So it seems to be a very key regulator that is downstream of store operated calcium entry, which drives the transcriptional, you know, uh, sort of profile of those neurons. And uh, in fact, if you now take a molecule in this case, uh, this one here, which is uh, which will prevent you know the the removal of these trimethyl marks. So this is a methylase, and you put that into the E one ATA, you also get rescue. So essentially telling us that this K thirty six trimethyl mark is what SOCE is driving on the chromatin, and that if you change the levels of this mark, you can actually bring back flight in these not in these flies which have no store operated calcium entry. So that seems to be the key effector in this case, working through TRL. Uh, <clears throat> so here we are, yeah. So this is essentially showing you that this, uh, this uh, uh, acetylcholine, which drives the, you know, the, the first response, acts through this muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, causes IP3 mediated calcium release, and leads to store operated calcium entry. And this whole mechanism, which if you drive, if you put in the E1 ATA gene, you can see that this response is gone. So here's the response in response when you put acetylcholine. In the set two knockdown, this goes away. In the ORI E1 ATA, it goes away. But when you do set two over, over expression, it comes back to a reasonable amount. And that's shown here. So essentially telling us that this is a way by which we can restore back function to these cells. And uh, I think this is probably the last part of this uh, uh, this part of it. Uh, just showing that these inputs uh, drive this whole mechanism. Uh, we've run it, put it as a sort of uh, loop because, as I said, you know that we get end up getting as a result of set two, we get drive more of this uh, signaling because it up regulates IP3 receptor and muscarinic acetylcholine receptor drives more intracellular calcium release. And as a result, you get more and more. And as a result of this, you get a developmental gene expression program, which then does the excitability of those cells, which then drive circuit function. So, and then allow for flight. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to briefly touch on why I think this is actually relevant in, in uh, humans. So this is in mammalian neurons. And what you can see here are many of these genes that I talked about, which are involved in uh, calcium signaling. So in, in, in humans and in, in mouse, there are two stems, there are three ORIs. There are these other channels, which are also linked to store operated calcium entry, the TRIPS. And then there's the ranidine receptor, which as I said, is involved in, in intracellular calcium release. And here's the IP3 receptor genes. And you can see many of these are really hugely expressed in the Purkinje neurons, which I already showed you are important in this context in the terms of spinocerebellar ataxia. But then they're also expressed in a number of other neurons. And you can see here in the hippocampus, they're hugely expressed, but then they're not expressed in certain other cells. So it, it is clearly the signaling is cell specific, happens in certain neurons and drives certain you know, neuronal function. Uh, in mouse, which we did this work, which I'm not going to go into the details of, but what we did find was that if you knock out stim in the Purkinje neurons, and this is a stim staining, if you knock it out in the Purkinje neurons, uh, what you end up with are cells which actually look pretty normal. But if you do a uh, gene expression analysis of them, you do find age-dependent changes. And many of those age-dependent changes are in you know, channels of various kinds and also in other fact things. So, you know, sort of not, it's not completely out of, uh, you know, sort of imagination that I'm saying that this mechanism could be operating in Purkinje neurons as well. And so what we're trying to do now with Dimple is to try and figure out whether the, the methylation changes, the histone methylation changes that I talked about, whether those happen in human neurons. And uh, this is sort of getting going with that and trying to figure out. And I think what will be particularly important will be to try and figure out whether those changes that I'm talking about, whether they happen in the SCA29 condition.
briefly just mentioned that there are a number of other SCAs that are known, many of which actually do affect calcium signaling. And so it's possible that this mechanism is not just in the SCA29, but could be in other kinds of SCAs also. And that is something, again, that we are trying to look at by you know, studying human neurons. So I'll stop here. I uh, hope I haven't gone too much over time. I just wanted to introduce the people who, so, who began this work. So Trambuk began the E180A work. Uh, Bipon began the work in uh, the, you know, the, the IP3 receptor work and knockdown of it with SOCE in human neurons. Shlesha started the work in uh, the, uh, the flight promoting dance. Uh, Nandishri has done all the work that I talked to you about in the stim knockout uh, flies that I discussed. And uh, Pragya is the one who finished finished all the work that Bipon had started. So she's the one who's done the major bulk of the work for the IP3 receptor and the store-operated calcium entry. Dhanya was the single uh, mouse person in the lab, and she did the last bit of work that I talked to you about. And Rishav is the one who has actually spent all his time figuring out this whole gene expression uh, you know, the, the link between store operated calcium entry and gene expression. Uh, so now most of them are now postdocs in various labs and are hopefully moving on to better and bigger things. Thank you. Yeah. Mm, very nice. Very nice work. Um, I just wondering. So, um, in in an animal that's flying, um, are both the neuromodulatory inputs and calcium signaling episodic, or or you know not continuous? And so, would you also anticipate the gene expression um, through calcium signaling? occurs during normal you know, trying, trying, yeah, whether it actually happens during so I don't know about store operated calcium entry I really no way of knowing that but from other people's work uh, and this is uh, work done by people like Vanessa Ruta who have actually looked at uh, behaving animals so I'm, again I, we don't know about flight because flight hasn't been possible to look at but other kinds of behaviors where IP3 mediated calcium release is involved uh, she has shown that it actually happens then and there, you know, within a few seconds or so two or three seconds. So behavior in flies happens over seconds, you know, or maybe even sometimes minutes. Yeah. And for example, the flight assay we do is over 15 minutes. Uh, in, in the context of what she was looking at, she was looking at olfactory behavior and learning and, you know, choice. And they found that actually IP3 mediated calcium release does affect the way that dopamine is released. So if you have the signal, you get more dopamine release. If you don't have the signal, you get. So yes, it's, some of it is happening in real time. In this context, I actually, I mean, it's hard to say because measuring these kind of things in flying flies, at least we haven't been able to do. I think it'll happen though. I think, you know, with the tools that are available, it will probably start happening, but it hasn't happened yet. Getty, very thought provoking. But uh, I, I was wondering, most of the membrane of the cell is in the endoplasmic reticulum, 50 to 90 percent, depending on the cell type. Uh, a small fraction of it is in physical molecular proximity to the plasma membrane, right? So uh, most of it is not in, so that if right. you, this right. interaction between ODI and STEM is a physical interaction, uh, the, the PLA Correct. shows that, Correct. right? So, Correct. So is the distribution of the stim uniform of the year or more on the uh, which is proximate to yeah, the yeah. plasma so, membrane? So, so those so, are, yeah, yeah. And, and then and connected to that, then finally also, as you said, it's not. So I was wondering where the geometry of the cell, because T cells also have large nuclei, where a little more cytoplasm, more perhaps here close to the membrane. So, and even the last image that you showed that it's not just about neurons and T cells, but even among neurons, there are differences, Absolutely. right? So this Parkinsy neurons are huge, right? And uh, right okay. next to them, you have this tiny, tiny cellular granule neurons, and they seem to have a hardly any expression, right? Yeah. So I was wondering whether geometry could be a, a parameter. So. I, I think it will definitely be because so, so the whole of this SOCE is hugely dependent on the formation of these ERPM junctions. And, uh, and 
how many of them form and how well they form and how many are pre-existent and are sort of primed to form, all of that is important. And everything is different in different cells and as you say, in different neurons. So it, it will be, I think, inevitably sort of uh, neuron dependent and, you know, how much of it is already there and not there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's an open question. Nobody knows. Yeah. And stim is uniformly distributed on no, the ear. No, 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 it's not. It's not. Mm -hmm. Neither is the IP3 receptor. Okay. Nothing is uniformly distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing is uniformly done. Neither is ORI on the plasma membrane uniformly distributed. And, but, you know, for each cell type to know exactly where. So most of this work has been done in cultured cells. So how much is actually happening in, you know, what is happening in vivo? And it's, it's not known really. Yeah, it's not known. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. Hi, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, fantastic talk. So coming back to the first part of your talk, um, I was wondering, um, is, is it known that uh, ligand binding to IP3 receptor, like, does it, cause a change in the conformation yes. like how does okay. yes yes and is known. it uh, physically is it known that it interacts with ori or sim or sim i think no that's not known that's not known the fact that it causes a very big conformational change is so the ip3 receptor is a rather huge protein and it functions as a tetramers which is even huger so actually getting uh, cryo em structures of it there are groups that have been trying and they've got some cryo EM structures and there is some evidence. I mean, there's pretty good evidence now that when you get ligand binding, you get a huge conformational change that happens, which affects essentially the opening of the channel. And uh, whether that conformational change ends up in bringing IP3 receptor and stim close to each other, I think that's a, the, sort of the key question that comes out of our work. And it needs to be looked at. And I'm hoping somebody, because, so we are not really structural biologists, so I can't see us being able to do that, but I'm hoping somebody will do it. Yeah. Okay. I had just a second, uh, like a second question that since we saw a stunted growth phenotype uh, in the stim knockouts, I think stim knockouts. Right. And uh, also, as we say that in, in these knockouts, the cal basically the calcium entry within the cells is, uh, is perturbed. Is perturbed. Uh, yeah. And so, do we see uh, any uh, growth factor changes? The it, any changes in the expression of growth factor within the neurons? Because it is known that so we uh, haven't done that. So, so, so essentially, these are these larvae are small, and the kind of work that we could do in the adults by sorting neurons, uh, we couldn't really do that in this knockout in these uh, in these stem. The, the, there are many fewer neurons also in 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 the larval stage. So there are only about five cells there. And the brains are really small. So uh, if, if somebody wants to do it, you're welcome to come. You have to dissect some 5,000 brains and then sort them. <laughs> so it's not something that anybody agreed to do. I didn't even also try to get anybody to do it, honestly. So we don't know exactly what's going on in those neurons. Okay, that's why I moved on to the adult neurons because there it was actually doable. Yeah, we could actually take enough brains and get enough neurons to actually do that kind of RNA-seq. Yeah. Um, hi. Um... Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, I was I can't oh, see. Ah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering why in the Ori mutants you see uh, defects specifically in flight, but not other behaviors. So the videos show they could like wiggle around with their legs and everything just fine. So is it at no, the so level of these? I should uh, specify that these are uh, we are only expressing Ori in a few neurons. But having said that. Uh, we have done these experiments with uh, panneuronal expression and uh, we don't see an effect in other sets of neurons. So, so my hand-waving explanation for this is that there is the flight circuit when it's being put up probably requires signals that, you know, when it's being put integrated at the late pupil stage, you know, that time that I showed, it requires inputs which drive store operated calcium entry and maybe the walking neurons and all of those either don't require it or require it to a lesser extent and it can be compensated by other things, you know. So that is the only explanation I can give, but I don't know what it is. So if you uh, like uh, temporarily specify it to uh time like you are suggesting some kind of a critical period yeah, there is i showed actually showed that so there is a critical period which is very late in pupil development 
which is when when you uh, express this uh, transgene, this dominant negative, you see a flight deficit. Okay. And very early in after eclosion, which is when, you know, all these uh, uh, axonal projections are reaching the mushroom body and are, you know, sort of getting, you know, everything is getting set. That is the time when you need it. So it seems at later times, if you, if you uh, express it, we don't see a phenotype. But I have to say that, you know, these proteins are pretty perdurant. So they live for a long time. So, I mean, they're there on the cell membrane for a long time. So is the IP3 receptor, so is ORI. And that we've done independent experiments, which I didn't go into. So to actually check, and going back to the question that uh, I think Maitri asked, right? That is there an acute requirement for it during flight? Uh, we would have to go much later in flies and then drive it and then see if it happens. We haven't done those experiments because you have to get rid of the, the existing protein, which is wild type. That has to go and enough dominant negative has to get made to then form enough channels so that, you know, that are non-functional. You understand it's a little bit sort of, you know, one has to get it right. And we haven't done that. So what we've done is the stage at which this gene is expressed normally, maximally, express the dominant negative then so that most of the channels that are formed are non-functional. Hi, uh, hello. So, very nice talk. So my question was from the RNAC uh, finding that you have had regarding the channels. So what three category of channels were upregulated there or overrepresented, which were like potassium, sodium and chloride conductances. Right. So I was wondering whether you looked at the calcium dependent potassium conductances like the SKBKs, especially because they are associated with yeah. spinocerebellar ataxia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one second. Can I just, I, I, I'm just going to see if I can, I think I removed that slide because I thought there was just a bit too much stuff here, but I might still have that. And you can actually see which are the channels that are, no, I think I've removed it. Yeah. So I don't think SK and BK were affected. Okay. I really don't think so, mm -hmm. but it's possible, but I don't think they were. I think there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, channels that were uh, among the sodium classes and there were a lot of channels that were in the potassium lot. And calcium, actually, I'll tell you what was affected. The voltage-gated calcium channels were affected. Yeah. CAC. Okay. Cacophony. In flies, it's called yeah, cacophony. Yeah. yeah. VGCC. Yeah. So that was affected. And some of the subunits of CAC were also, I mean, of the voltage-gated calcium channel were affected. I don't think we saw BK and SK. Yeah. We didn't see that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Now I'll request everyone to hold on to your questions and catch Gaiti later. Um, we are really running short on time. So I would like to thank Gaiti once more. Let's join. Thank you. Okay. I also want to take 10 seconds of the time. Uh, so since I mentioned about the 40 years of the set, this is a small memento for today's speaker. Okay. Uh, I hope you liked it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So please join for a cup of tea. Yeah. Five, 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 five